Well, Pastor Mike Jones is our guest speaker this morning. Uh, he and I and his uh, wife and my wife go back 40 years. Yeah, we met when we were just infants. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Mike uh, and his family uh, wandered into the church plant that we started in Connecticut all those years ago. And the Lord uh, had called him into ministry. And uh, when we left that church plant, the Lord had uh, Pastor Mike take over. And he's been there for 25 years now. Uh, almost, right? More than that, okay. Going on 26. And uh, so, very thankful uh, for uh, Pastor Mike and his wife Sally. Good to have them here. The downside is that they have another appointment this afternoon, so after the morning service they have to take off. But uh, I'm glad that they are here at least for this morning service. And I asked him if he would come and share with us on this Mother's Day something from God's Word. And so, Brother Mike, if you would come. And by the way, as he comes, our wives bought us these sport coats uh, separately. <laughs> this was not planned. <laughs> They had a sale at Kohl's. I think that's what it was. I was trying to figure how we could have spun that to... Uh, um, but anyhow, uh, I think there was a sale that time. But uh, anyhow, it's so good to be here. I am so thankful to be here. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your pastor. You have a man of God here that loves the Word of God. And uh, I'm humbled to be able to be here. Uh, my wife and I were saved many, many years uh, ago. Oh, thank you. And uh, we were, uh, uh, actually, I was in the military. Uh, the Lord brought us to uh, Italy, a little island uh, off the coast of Italy. Uh, my wife and I were saved there. Uh, and then when we came back uh, to the States, uh, we were Catholic before we were saved. really didn't know what kind of church to go to. And uh, so we looked around. We uh, ended up in Charleston, South Carolina. And then uh, not really pastored uh, during that time. But then we uh, were stationed in Connecticut. And uh, while we're there, we're looking for churches, and uh, there was a little tiny advertisement. Uh, it was about one inch by inch and a half. It just said Cornerstone Baptist Church, and it had a telephone number. And uh, I remember calling the telephone number, and uh, your pastor uh, picked up. And, you know, he has a very mature voice. Uh, and back then, he was, uh, I can't remember, you're in your 20s at the time. And uh, so was I. And, uh, but I thought he was a much older man. And so I visited the, the church. He met me at the door. And my wife and I walked right by him. Not, not too rude. Uh, but uh, I thought, you know, I'm looking for the pastor. And uh, this young fella comes to the door. And so we walk by. And I'm looking around. And, and Pastor Bickle comes up behind me. And he introduces himself as the pastor. And I was like, whoa, you're, you're pretty young. And, uh, but anyway, uh, when uh, we went there, we only had two children. And he had two children. Uh, and about the same ages. And uh, then we just kept having children. And uh, your pastor has a lot of kids and we have a lot of kids and uh, but we we counted that some very some of our most precious times uh, I think uh, I was probably most discipled uh, under the ministry of Pastor Bickle uh, and really my own calling into the ministry was solidified uh, during my time at Cornerstone Baptist Church and uh, I'm so thankful to be the pastor of it now if you had asked me uh, even a few months before I became the pastor, if I would ever be the pastor of Cornerstone Baptist Church, I would say, you know, I would love to be, but that'll never happen. Pastor Bickle is going to be there forever. Uh, but uh, the Lord worked it out uh, for him to move on and for me to be able to move in. And uh, so to be here is uh, really thrilling to me, but also very humbling uh, to fill the pulpit of a man of God that, uh, that loves the Word. I'm telling you, you are so blessed. Uh, to have someone that handles the Word of God as Pastor Bickle does, and so faithful. Uh, and uh, his family, as you know, I'm not telling you anything differently, am I? Uh, but uh, I do praise the Lord uh, to be able to be here. Well, happy Mother's Day. Uh, moms, you are the best. 
and uh, praise God for you. Where would we be without our moms, right? Uh, especially moms that love the Lord. And remember early on in my ministry, right, 25 years ago, on Mother's Day, I would think, you know, it's always good to preach from Mother's Day uh, passages like, like Proverbs 31, right? And uh, so I remember preaching out of Proverbs 31 and then going home and my wife saying, wow, I'll never... I'll never be like the Proverbs 31 lady. And uh, and then after talking to some of the other ladies, it was like, man, we didn't want to go out to eat. You know, we just felt so terrible uh, after Proverbs 31. And so I'm not going to preach from Proverbs 31 today. Uh, but I do want to preach to you of what uh, I believe to be God's high calling for women. And you know, it is a calling of God. And I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, if you will, please, to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And you know, like every other calling of God, a woman's calling is under attack today. Would you say that uh, the preaching ministry of your good gospel preaching church is under attack? Absolutely. Well, think of mothering children as really the private application of a preaching ministry in individual lives. Because moms, that's what you do. Uh, now, I'm going to be preaching some things this morning that are not necessarily common uh, or even very popular, even in evangelical Christianity. Uh, the things that I'll be preaching this morning are actually disdained by the world that we live in. But uh, on this Mother's Day, I really want us to magnify God's high calling for women. Uh, the world's not going to do that. As a matter of fact, uh, the world is going to try to minimize, it's going to try to diminish your own estimation of meeting uh, the requirements of this passage. Uh, as I'm sure you know, the culture that we live in attacks uh, your own mind and attach your own regard for your calling in the home. And so I want to just preach to you this morning from just one verse uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and that verse is verse 14. If you look at that with me, the Apostle Paul writes, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, if we just let the Word of God stand, if we let the Word of God stand, I mean, if we were just to read that passage, what is the will of God in general according to that verse for younger women? I mean, if we just look at that one verse, the will of God is apparent, right? It's that she what? It's that she marry. Is that what that says? That's exactly what it says. Uh, but there are people that will argue this and say, well, no, uh, that's merely the Apostle Paul's opinion here. That's just his viewpoint. viewpoint. That's not actually a command of God. Of course, we need to be reminded, right, that uh, uh, the doctrine of inspiration uh, tells us that everything that's written in this book is written by the Holy Spirit, right? And that even a writer's personal reasonings are considered God's Word. The Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, it tells us that there is no scripture that is given uh, by any personal interpretation. Uh, that is that no scripture is just the opinion of the writer. Uh, when Paul wrote these words, God wrote these words through him. Uh, and even the, the statements that he prefaced uh, as his own personal statements, it was the Holy Spirit who was breathing out those words. The, the reason I say that, folks, is because this passage is applicable today for all of us, just as all Scripture is. Now, in the context, if you look at the context of 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, you see it's part of a passage that's actually dealing with widows. And uh, his point is how young, unmarried widows should marry. Uh, but you know, when you look at this, the reasons for widows to remarry uh, can be applied to younger unmarried women also. Uh, when I look at verse 14, I don't see anything to imply that this teaching is just restricted to young widows. 
Uh, so what is the will of God then for younger women? Well, first of all, he says that they should marry. And let me give you just four quick biblical reasons for marriage. Uh, number one, Genesis 1.28 tells us that we need to be fruitful, to multiply. Uh, that is that we bear children. And uh, Malachi 2.15 tells us that God is looking for a godly seed. And of course, in the context, uh, there is a, a, a messianic uh, context there. Uh, but it's not that the earth needs more people, folks. God wants the earth to be filled with a particular kind of people, godly people. Uh, so God wants us to, to multiply, to have a godly seed, that there would be a testimony in the world. But also the second reason for marriage is seen in Genesis 2 and verse 18. And that is that because men need wives. Is that true? Yeah. How many of you wives, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you thought, yeah, right? How many of you husbands thought that? Well, you should. Uh, you know, God created the woman to be a helper to the man. That is a, 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 a helper that is fit to complete him. And a woman complements the man and enables him to accomplish God's work in a greater way. Uh, you remember that God observed that it was not good that the man uh, was alone, that he should be alone. Uh, can you imagine, men, those of you that are married, can you imagine uh, not having your wife there to help you? Uh, my wife has helped me out of many, many troubles. Uh, as a matter of fact, picking out sports coats, for instance. Um, as you see, uh, uh, Pastor and uh, or my wife and uh, Nancy uh, had very good taste in sport coats. Uh, but, uh, uh, but really, I, I, there have been many times, uh, and this is not just the only reason, but when I walk out, uh, many times I'll be walking out to preach and my wife as kindly as she can will say oh are you really going to wear that <laughs> and uh, you know a smart man will stop and he'll think you know I better rethink this and many times I have rethought it and I'll go into the church and people say wow that's a great combination there <laughs> and I say well yeah uh, but uh, no, I do I do give my wife the uh, uh, the credit for that. But uh, uh, I'm really thankful uh, for my wife. And I know that uh, if you're a godly man, you are thankful for your wife also. You, you need your wife's God created wives, right, for us to, to be able to accomplish his work in a greater way. All right, so ladies, you are, you are needed. Uh, another aspect of this, I don't know how many of you have ever read uh, a book called Sacred Marriage. Pastor, have you heard of that book? It's by Gary Thomas. Uh, it's, uh, the premise of the book is really great. The, the idea is, uh, well, it's in the subtitle of the book, which says something like this. Uh, what if God intended marriage not to make you happy, but to make you holy? And the idea is that, uh, that God gave you the particular spouse that you have, not just to make you happy, because sometimes, even in Christian marriages, when people aren't happy, they think, well, my marriage must not be right. But if you get the idea, well, God has given you your spouse to make you holy, then the whole idea is that this is part of my sanctification. And God gave you your spouse to help you to become holy, to become sanctified. And, and it really changes your whole aspect of, uh, of your wife. And, as, and uh, so it helps you to understand that uh, she is certainly needed. But thirdly, uh, even as 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 12 tells us, uh, it tells us that purity is a reason for marriage. Uh, we get married to avoid fornication. And then number four, we have Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, that uh, reveal that marriage is actually a portrayal of something. Uh, it is a testimony to the world of the relationship of Jesus Christ to his church. And that's supposed to be expressed uh, through our marriages. Uh, so there are at least four biblical reasons for us to get married, for young women to get married. Uh, but when you look through the scriptures, you'll see there are, there's at least one exception to that, right? Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7, uh, Paul says, For I would that all men were even as myself. And in the context there, he's referring to him being single. And, uh, he, and in that same verse, though, he refers to that, that being single as a gift. 
And the word that he uses is the same word. It's the word charisma, uh, referring to spiritual gifts. And his point there is that some people are actually gifted by God to be single for a particular purpose. And Paul expands on that in verses 32 to 35 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And what he does there is actually explain that this singleness that he's talking about is given by God expressly to serve him. Right? To give their lives more fully to him. But, but really, that's the exception. Uh, the general exhortation that we see in Scripture is that young women should what? Should marry. All right? That's what Paul is telling us here. And you know what, parents, if you have, uh, if you have daughters, and, and by the way, thank you ladies for singing this morning. What a blessing to have uh, a mom and her daughter singing. Uh, just, uh, just a blessing. Uh, but if you have daughters, you ought to prepare them for marriage. Uh, we don't often hear this, but that, but that ought to be their ambition before the Lord. Because this is a high calling of God. This is God's high calling. And ladies, you should never, ever be ashamed of that. You should never be ashamed of, of being called a housewife. I know uh, uh, some the, the world looks at it like, oh, you're just a housewife? God looks at it as, I want you to be a housewife. I want you to be a mom. Uh, one that will raise children uh, for my glory. Again, the Lord does, again, single out individuals for himself to serve in a single status. Uh, but whatever your calling is, you need to magnify that for God's service. Um, listen, if, you're, if you believe that you are called to be single, uh, uh, that singleness was not given to you to advance your career. And that's what the world tells you. Right? You stay single uh, and advance your career. Uh, it's not for you to pursue your own ambitions. God keeps you single for his glory. He keeps you single for the good of the church, for the body of Christ. Again, though, the majority, though, uh, women should marry and dedicate themselves wholly to the, to the marriage that God has given to them. Again, you're not going to hear that from the world. And you're not going to hear that from Christians that embrace worldly thinking. But that's what God's Word teaches us. So the second requirement then, that's the first requirement that young women should marry. But the second requirement really goes hand in hand with the first. But let me say this, the order matters, right? The order is important. Uh, marry, then bear children, all right? Uh, the world gets it mixed up sometimes, doesn't it? And let me tell you something, folks. There are Christians out there that are getting this mixed up. When I first got saved, I never thought I would hear a Christian argue about uh, having relationships before marriage, having children even before marriage. I never thought I would hear that, but I'm hearing it today. It's amazing what, uh, what kind of things Christians fall into. Uh, but uh, here the exhortation is that married women must be willing to bear children. Um, again, I've even heard uh, Christian women argue against having children at all. Uh, or saying, you know, I just, I think we'll just have two, or I'll have one, or have three, whatever. Um, and by the way, three, in my, from my perspective, is small. All right, and your pastor also. Uh, but why would a Christian woman argue that way? Because the world says they're a burden. Don't they? I mean, the world, you, you want to mess up your life? Have kids. That's what the world says, right? Uh, they, will cr they will cramp your style. The world says the kids will break your stuff. And they will make your house smell funny. They do. And listen, they do all of those things, right? Kids do all of those things. How many boys do you have, brother? Five boys, all right? And, and then three girls or two girls? Two girls. Well, we had five boys and one girl. Do you know boys break stuff? Uh, I, I mean, they don't even have to try. Uh, they, they break stuff. But, but that's how kids are. You know, that's how kids are. But, but let me ask you, does that mean we can ignore the will of God? If God tells us to do something, we shouldn't listen to the world and get, get their input on whether we should obey him or not. But oftentimes we do. 
because some of these the arguments that they bring uh, ring true to our flesh. Yeah, they do do these things. They will cramp my style. I want to go here. I want to go there. But I can't because I have kids. My wife and I were talking. We just came back on vacation. Do I look like I've been on vacation for a couple of weeks? Yes, thank you. But, uh, uh, you know, when we had kids, we not only did we not go on vacation, we never went out to eat. You know, you bring six kids into a restaurant. Uh, you've probably been in restaurants where somebody brought their six kids. Well, we never did that. Right? There are things you don't do when you have a lot of kids. But when you obey the word of God, you do it and just count it all joy. I'm doing this because of, of the Lord. Uh, I'm telling you what, having children is one of the greatest blessings you can have. But also, it is one of the greatest ways of extending your godly influence into the world. That's why uh, the psalmist says in Psalm 127, verses 4 and 5, uh, when the psalmist says that they are like arrows, children are like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. You know, when you shoot an arrow, you are influencing by uh, extension, aren't you? Uh, in a sense. Uh, but also, arrows are used for provision. Arrows are used for protection. Uh, mothers, I'm telling you, you have around your feet lives of great value. And God has entrusted you with these lives. Uh, whatever they do for good or whatever they do for bad will have an eternal consequence. And so you need to make it your ambition uh, to raise these children in the Word of God, to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, I'll say this to dads. Uh, uh, you ought to be the ones that uh, are really demonstrating this in your home by having devotions with your children. Uh, oftentimes, the moms are the ones that uh, really encourage that. But I want to encourage you dads. Support your, your wives. And really, uh, you ought to have devotions in your home every single day to nurture up the, your children in the Lord. Raise them to love the Lord and raise them to use their gifts for God. Keep them from the influences that would try to misdirect the use of their gifts. I remember reading a story by, uh, about Charles Wesley. And Charles Wesley, you know Charles Wesley. Uh, you probably sing some of his hymns. Uh, but uh, he, had, he had very musical children also. And he tells the story himself. You may have already heard this. But his own son, Charles Jr., was very gifted as a musician. And, uh, and uh, Charles himself would promote uh, young Charles uh, uh, to the world. Uh, because of his proficiency in music. And Charles Wes uh, Wesley regretted that in his latter days because he said, he said that uh, uh, his children were snatched by the world because he promoted their gifts. Uh, mothers, you can be too ambitious for your children uh, where you actually, you actually push them into the praising arms of the world's influence. Uh, don't let your children be snatched by the world. Teach them to use their gifts for God's glory. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities in the church for your children to use their gifts, and that's what God intends. I'll tell you, it will be a great sorrow to you if they should attain greatness in this world, yet they, they end up ignoring the things of God. And so uh, we need to think that way. So he says, bear children, rear them for the Lord. Uh, I read one man on this, and he wrote this. He said, women should be diligent in preparing for this task. It is a noble task, but it is a task that needs preparation. He says uh, uh, they need diligent preparation because there is no other sphere where failure brings more serious penalties. He said this, that engineers and doctors need proper training. How much more should a mother who is fashioning the souls of the men and women of tomorrow, learn at the highest of all schools and from the master sculptor himself, God. He concludes by saying this, there is no higher height to which humanity can attain than that occupied by a converted, heaven-inspired praying mother. That is so true. 
what what a what an elevated position you have, moms. Uh, what a what a glorious position, a position for you to have great influence in the kingdom of God through your children. Uh, encourage your children to use their gifts for God. Uh, but listen, don't even let your daughter's gifts, and I'm sure that, that many of you have daughters that have all these different kinds of gifts, but don't let your daughter's gifts overshadow God's primary will for her, that she marry, that she bear children, and then thirdly, look at verse 14, that you guide the house. Now this is really an interesting term. If you look up this term, this term guide the house actually means the house despot, the house despot. And uh, ladies, that's your sphere of rule. And you are the despots of your home. And every wise man learns that very quickly. Now, I don't want to step on any toes, but I always find it very confusing when I hear a man take such an interest in some of the domestic things in the home. Uh, what color you want the kitchen, where you want uh, the canisters to be placed. Uh, you know, I think, why do you even care about that? Right? That's your, that's, that's your wife's domain. If she wants to have the kitchen in a particular color, she wants to have a particular kind of canister, she wants to, to, to run that domain her way, why would you even get in the way? That's what God has given her. That's her place. Um, when I was down in Greenville, South Carolina, I went to a church, Mount Calvary Baptist Church, and when I first started going there, the pastor there was Pastor Jesse Boyd. Pastor, uh, your pastor knows Pastor Jesse Boyd, uh, and he's with the Lord now, but uh, he was in the ministry many, many years, and he was a big man from Alabama, and he had a big voice. And his wife was a little petite lady, uh, Edith was her name, and, uh, and, and he, she, she just treated him like a king. But one time we uh, got together, he was teaching us uh, a, a men's class about wives, and uh, he said, uh, men, in dealing with your wives, and again, this is a booming voice, I can't even uh, pretend to be as booming as he is, he said, in dealing with your wives, you need to be firm. He said, you need to put your foot down. And he said, you need to do everything she tells you. Right? And, uh, and I learned from that. You know, Titus chapter 2 and verse 5 tells us that, that women are to be keepers at home. And folks, that doesn't mean confined to the house. Uh, but it means to be a home worker. Right, a worker in the home, and it's the emphasis on the emphasis on the fact that a a woman at home is a worker. I know that you've probably heard things like this too, uh, but uh, sometimes when you're mingling with people, and uh, they'll ask you, well, "What do you do?" Uh, well, I do this, you know, I do that, and uh, and then a lady will say, "Well, you know, I'm a homemaker," and you can almost see people's countenance change. Like, oh, you mean you don't do anything? You mean like, like you're a homemaker? Uh, I'm telling you what, I would not want to be a homemaker. Uh, I would not have to be at home with all of my kids uh, the way that my wife had to. I'm thankful that I had, you know, other things to do. But, uh, but anyway, uh, th that's what it's saying here. It's... Uh, Biblically, a woman diligently gives herself to this ministry. It's the, it's the calling of God in your home. Again, it's not something that you should ever be ashamed of, but something that you would diligently give yourself to. And husbands, you ought to, you ought to be elevating that ministry in your homes. Now, as I said, society mounts this, this relentless attack on this calling, and really, it has been since World War II. You know, every now and then, the media will have a story, you may have heard these stories too, uh, about a POW that was found on some island somewhere, right, uh, that have been fighting a war that has been ended for years and years. And of course, we're concerned about getting our troops home from any war that they might be stuck in. Uh, but the fact is, folks, there is a whole generation who never came home, even from World War II. 
Uh, and those were the women that worked in the munitions factories in World War II. Uh, these ladies went out, they wanted to support their country, but uh, you know, they learned what it was to become independent. They learned what it was to have a paycheck, to have a position, and to have some prestige, and they never came back home. And the fact is, they, they pass this on as the normal lifestyle, and we're reaping that today. Uh, I don't know, I'm sure you've heard just the, the dilemma that many people have been put in because of this pandemic, right? Moms at work, dads at work, and then school is out, right? Have you had to deal with that? Uh, I, but I know many people that have had to do that, right? They, they expect a certain income, and then the kids have to be home, and mom has to stay home. And that's created quite a difficulty for many people. But you know, a secular psychiatrist, his name is Dr. Nicolayan, uh, he wrote a paper where he stated that the prime factors for the destruction of the home were number one, divorce, and secondly, that both parents were working full time, right? This is the world that looks at what's going on and comes up with that kind of determination. Well, that's what the Bible teaches also. And uh, so the high calling of God for women is that they guide the home. That is your, that your sphere of ministry. And, uh, and because our minds have been so affected by our society, uh, we just don't see that as important. I thank the Lord when I was saved, many, many years ago. Uh, when I was saved, my wife and I recognized the importance of her being at home with my children. Uh, when, when you make that decision, your pastor had the same decision, right? Uh, when, when you make that decision, there, there's just things you don't do, right? There are just things you don't have that the world has to offer. And what that is is a trade-off of giving your children what they need from the Lord. Right, having a, a, a mom at home uh, to teach them. And, and I'm very thankful uh, that my wife was able to do that. And I believe that's what, uh, that's what God expects. Now, I don't believe that the Bible forbids women for, uh, working out, from working outside the home, but it certainly doesn't command it. And it certainly doesn't encourage it. Uh, the, world, the world kind of pictures keepers at home as these lazy ladies, right, just lounging around, uh, eating bonbons and uh, watching television. That's how the world looks at it. Uh, the world would say, you know, if you really want to be a help to your family, if you want to help your family get ahead, you need to get a job. Right? You need to get out and do something. You need to bring in another paycheck. Listen, the Bible never reasons that way, folks. It never does. You know, even girls in Christian colleges, uh, those that may major in home economics, they're looked at as being a little bit backward, right? I, and people will say, you know, you need, to, you need to study something that's profitable. You need to study something that's going to be useful in your home. I'll tell you what, in the last 25 years, I've counseled many, many men that wish their wives had had some training in being a keeper at home. Wish their wives had a little bit of training in rearing children for God. Now folks, what I'm trying to do this morning is to strike the same chord that Scripture does concerning this. And this is what that note sounds like. Get married, have some kids, and rear them for God. Yes, you do have the liberty uh, to do other things, but not at the expense of your primary calling. And it's an elevated calling biblically. And, and when we understand that, it's up to us, if our, if our thinking is not in line with Scripture, that we align it, that we, we come before God and say, God, I know that's what it says, my heart's not there. Give me the grace or help me to have access to the grace where my thinking will be in a line with thy word. Right? That's the kind of thinking that we need to do. Listen, we, we need our wives and our moms to return home. Right? They need to be there to, to serve God this way. And listen, we need to honor them for being there. There were times that, uh, that I worked three jobs at a time. Uh, I could have said, hey, hun, 
right? Let's, uh, let's step up to the plate, you know? But she was already at the plate, right? She was already doing all of this in the home. And, and I thought, you know what, I need to, I, if I want to make ends meet or if I want a little bit extra, I'm the one that's responsible for that so that I can honor what God has called her to do. And you know, what we need, you know what we need now? We need a school like the school that was started by the sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Does that name sound familiar? Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote a book. Do you remember what it was? Starts with Uncle, Uncle Tom's Cabin. All right, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Am I, am I right? Yes. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Well, anyway, it's not about Harriet. Um, her, he, she had a sister named Catherine. And Catherine started a school, of all places, in my neck of the woods, in Hartford, Connecticut. I'll tell you what, if you went to Hartford, Connecticut now, you would not notice any influence of this school. But she started a school. It was called the Hart Hartford Female Seminary. I know, we don't believe in women preachers, right? But this wasn't a preaching seminary. This was a seminary that was started in 1823 in Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, it was a school that taught girls, that taught women to be lovers of their husbands to be lovers of their children, to be keepers at home, and to, to be able to run a successful household. Uh, this, this is school they went to to learn how to rear children. How, how much do we need that now? But this was a school that trained them in all of the employments of domestic life. And the key was is that they were taught to do this joyfully happily as unto the Lord. Uh, that sounds like a whole different planet, doesn't it? When you know 198 years ago, folks, this, this world was a different planet than that we're experiencing today. Uh, back then, women were more inclined to embrace God's ca high calling uh, for them. Uh, and you know what? Uh, verse 14, it, it gave no occasion for the adversary to speak reproachfully. Of Christian women. Uh, you know, the adversaries may uh, demean this kind of behavior, but they can't call into question the cause of Christ. They can't. Folks, to think this way is rare nowadays, wouldn't you agree? It absolutely is. But the fact is, it's God's Word. And uh, even as uh, was mentioned even earlier in the scripture reading and in, in, in the devotion, uh, we need to get back to obeying the word of God, every part of it. That's what God expects. When we stand before him, we're going to be, we're going to be held accountable to how we apply this to our lives, how we adjust our thinking to scripture and obeying the truths of the word of God. And... Uh, it's rare, but it's God's word. And listen, ladies, if you think this way, and even husbands, if you think this way, uh, but especially ladies, if you think this way, one day uh, when your husband may be known in the gates and your children rise up and call you blessed, you'll see that God's mind was right on this. And uh, listen, the only way that you can do this is by the power of God. Right? We understand that, that none of us has this kind of power in and of ourselves. This has got to be something that God does through us. And uh, if you're here today and you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, well, that's your first step, right? To believe on him. Uh, of course, the Bible tells us that we're all sinners, right? Uh, we're all sinners. We're all bound to a devil's hell. Uh, but praise God, he provided a means for us to be saved. I thank God for that. Uh, the Lord brings me back to the day of my salvation many, many times. And I rejoice in that, as those of you that are saved ought to, often. Uh, but God sent Jesus to die for our sins. He provided a means for us to escape the, the penalty of hell and eternal damnation in the, in the lake of fire. But as you know, what that means is for us to benefit from that, we have to believe on him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. We have to uh, accept that work 
that Jesus did on our behalf and call upon the name of the Lord and ask him to save us, right? It's not something that just happens automatically. None of us were born Christians. None of us were uh, uh, Christian by the, by the fact that we're in a Christian family. It's an individual thing. If you've never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, today could be the day of your salvation. And, uh, and I know that, that uh, the folks here would love to be able to share with you how you can have that, that eternal joy uh, that eternal confidence that you will be with the Lord forever. Uh, but if you are saved, then the only way you can live this way is by yielding to the Spirit of God. The Bible tells us to walk in the Spirit. And if we walk in the Spirit, will not what? Will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Let me tell you something. The, the flesh lusts against the things that I've said today. Your flesh doesn't want to do these things. Your flesh wants to do what the world does. But for you to be able to apply these things to your life, you've got to yield yourself to the Spirit of God. Now, be not drunk or under the influence with wine, right? But be filled, be under the control of the Spirit of God. And you, God will, will uh, arrange your thinking according to His Word. But it takes us determining to do that. God doesn't uh, make us do things against our will. I have even prayed. I said, God, you know, j just do it. Right? I, I wouldn't mind being a puppet in God's hands. But that doesn't honor him. He wants us to do it from the heart. He wants us to obey him. And that requires that we walk in the spirit. And you can only conform by doing that. And that means putting off the attitudes and the actions of this world and humbling ourselves before God and yielding our mind, our heart, our body to please God. And hopefully... Uh, that is your desire. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank thee so much for the moms that are here. I'm thankful for all of our moms. Lord, I do pray that, that this will be a special day for the ladies here, the ladies in my own church. And Father, I just pray that thou wouldst use uh, this instruction in the word to help us to, uh, to form up our thinking according to the scripture. I do pray that the Spirit of God would help us where the flesh wrestles with these things. And Lord, I pray that we would see Thee glorified, that we would see homes that are, are lifting Thee up. And Lord, again, we just pray that Thou wouldst continue to use these truths in our lives throughout the day, cause us to, to be thoughtful of them, and we will give Thee the glory for all that is done. We ask it in Jesus' marvelous name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. Oh, that was a great reminder, huh? <laughs> Don't hear that much anymore in these days. In fact, I, you know, it used to be if there was, uh, you know, times where maybe there was a big storm and people were stuck at home in a blizzard, the birth rates would go up. I heard that uh, this past year during the pandemic that the birth rates have dropped lower than they ever have in the United States of America. Average of 1.6 children in 2020. And uh, so that doesn't bode well. You know, that does not, uh, that does not look like we're going to survive as a culture if we continue in that direction. So. Let's, let's uh, bear children. Godly children, that's the key, right? Godly children. And, uh, you know, moms, the time that you put in with your kids, um, you realize that's your grandchildren you're influencing as well. Uh, and I really believe, biblically, that the, the real um, proof of a godly home is found in the grandchildren. If that generation follows the Lord, that says something about the, the grandparents' home that was uh, established. And then the next generation, the great-grandchildren, you know what, we want this to keep going. We want this, we want to have godly children until Jesus returns. And it doesn't happen by accident. It happens by hearing Scripture, like was shared with us today,
taking it to heart and then depending upon God to accomplish that through your lives. That's what we want. You don't know the Lord is your savior. The bottom line is this is impossible without him. And uh, your greatest need, if you're not saved, is not to have kids, but your greatest need is to have a savior. You need to trust him personally, first of all, and then you can have the joy of seeing your children come to know him and your children's children. And you can see that uh, continue on until the Lord calls us home. We're going to stand together and sing a closing number. And uh, perhaps this might be a good time for you if the Lord has specifically spoken to your heart about something. Maybe a wrong attitude that you've had uh, towards some of these things that were shared today. That you get it squared away with the Lord and say, Lord, you know what? I've been wrong. My attitude has been just, uh, it, it's, been, it's been affected by the world. And remember what the scripture says there. If we don't get this straight, if we don't get this stuff straight, it's going to, the adversary, the enemy, is going to use it mm -hmm. against the Lord and the Lord's people. Mm -hmm. uh, it, if, if we don't uh, follow the scripture, we're going to lose our testimony and uh, we'll be just like them. And, and that's not what we're about. So let's